Hello, everybody. I have a really interesting conversation lined up for you today. Uh, we have seen this month, it has been quite momentous in India's history. And we have seen a uh, Ram Mandir come up in Ayodhya. The concept of Ram, the idea of Lord Ram, the epic of the Ramayan. This has many, many versions and Tulsi Das's version of the 16th century is the one that has captured popular imagination across the country. Now, what does Ram stand for? What are some of the lessons we can take away? And how do we engage? Uh, how do we engage with the fact that um, uh, Ram and the epic will now have a larger hold on our public life and definitely the popular imagination? To get some of the these answers, I'm going to turn to someone who studied mythology very deeply and who has used his learning over time to piece together answers to eternal questions about the human condition. Please welcome the very, very popular writer, illustrator, speaker, and deep thinker, Devdat Patnaik. Devdat, thank you so much for doing this conversation. It's a time when uh, there is so much talk about Ram, and there are also many things that I find I don't understand understand and I want to try and understand better and you know you're the person I go to when this happens. Thank you. Thank you so much. Devdat, you have written more than three books on Ram and you know you've parsed the Ramayan epic and in a previous conversation with me you had told me how every time you read this epic the grandeur of the epic it nourishes you it leaves you charged. What is it about Ram that people need to understand in terms of what he signifies and uh, what he means in the context of the 21st century. The thing is, people try to see Ram in isolation. And in Indian thought, you never look at things in isolation. It's like a thali. Imagine I serve you a thali and you love the pickle. But the dish is not the pickle. The dish is the rice, the dal, the sabzi, the papad. Everything is given together and then each thing complements the other dish. And that's how Indian thalis are designed. In the same way, Indian wisdom is designed around many, 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 many ideas. One of them being Ram. So a while, yes, it, you know, from a marketing point of view, we always know that a single idea and hammer in one idea because you want to mobilize a people, we don't have to walk that path. We have to see Ram in the way they have presented the sages and the uh, whoever were the thinkers over the time, over a century, collective memory has worked to create Ram and communicate very powerful ideas so that we can live a happy life. And it's that idea of Ram which I genuinely enjoy because it has solved so many of my issues, my problems in life. As an Indian, you keep wondering, you know, what is Hinduism? You know, unlike other religions where there is a clear hmm. path that is given, a sort of clear path given. There is a book, there is a set of... Hinduism doesn't have that. It is an also, you know, when you are raised in an urban ecosystem, nobody really teaches you that. There's no class that you will go to say to be a Hindu yes. or to learn things. So this is when you start reading Indian scriptures, you realize that it's a very amorphous approach where they're helping you Hmm. cope with the existence, cope with your life, cope with your challenges. And Ramayan plays a very critical role in it. Now, let's look at the scripture. Hmm. The scripture is about two, maybe two and a half thousand years old, but 2000 is a good rule of thumb to keep in our minds. Why is 2000 uh, very important? Because this was the time when Hinduism went through a massive transformation. The old Hinduism was this Vedic ritual where you invoke the gods and you sort things from them. Hmm. And then uh, there was a kind of a pushback by another monastic order, which says the purpose of life is not to seek material things, but to withdraw from the material world. And this has been the great Indian conflict. Should you en enjoy the world, all the pleasures of life, bhog, or should you withdraw from the world, you know, yoga, which is withdrawal from the world, the Buddhism and Jainism comes in this package. And Ramayana emerges to answer this question. And it doesn't emerge in isolation. It comes with the Mahabharata. The two epics cannot be separated from each other. Mm -hmm. And they are really talking about what does it mean to live a life where you as an individual withdraw from material things. However, you engage with the world which is seeking material things. Mm -hmm. So your personal journey has to be one of spirituality while you're fully aware that the world is a material space to be in. Mm -hmm. So you are a yogi 
who lives in the world of bhog and therefore ram is called the tapasvi raja the mm -hmm. hermit king what does it mean to be a hermit king mm -hmm. how do you live your life as a hermit king what does it mean to be a hermit king and i think that's what these scriptures and stories over the years and it captured the imagination of india it was written somewhere 2000 years ago but there are thousands and thousands of versions of it in almost every language it's not only in textual format it's on temple walls it's paintings it's puppetry it's theater it's song it's dance it's folk songs there's so much of ramayan out there that you keep wondering how it just obviously fires people's imagination what does it mean to be a good king what does it mean to be a brother what does it mean what do you want in your life how do you want your leaders to be and i think that aspiration was caught the idea was caught in ram but remember not in isolation because mm -hmm. ram has to be complemented with krishna mm -hmm. krishna and ram have to be complemented with shiva and all these are the different things in our indian thali of mythology telling us different different things so while yes everybody is excited by ram um, this focus misses the perspective and i think we should see the perspective and then understand the focus and then again go back to perspective and i think that's the wonderful thing about india where wisdom through storytelling has mm. been communicated mm. so the, you know you mentioned shiva you mentioned uh, krishna how do you see ram visa v you know because they all complement each other yeah. like you just said what does ram bring to the table what yeah. does krishna bring to the table or the thali which is the you know metaphor that you're using what do each one of these deities em emblemify or signify let's see what it is not so let's begin with what it is not so w traditionally when we use words like religion god we really are referring to ideas that come emerged in the middle east and spread around the world where there is a divine being outside creation who creates the world creates human beings tells humans how to live their life and if you follow your life as per the rules given by that almighty far away being um, you will go to heaven and if you don't follow the rules you'll go to hell so that's the broad i mean i'm simplifying it a bit but for the sake of you know just for the sake of understanding that this model of god message messenger alignment heaven and hell is not there in hinduism so that idea is not there really indian thoughts are talking about our our emotions our bodies what's going on with our body when we live our lives now in this ecosystem how do you live your life and this is when the stories come into picture the gods the goddesses they sort of participating in your life to help you find meaning and that's how these stories were designed that's why they're called pancham ved or the fifth veda veda being knowledge that helps you live a fulfilled life so there's no god there's no rule there is no alignment there's no that shiva told you to live your life this way the way i sometimes see these whatsapp forwards vishnu tells you to live your life this way i'm like who are these people what are they writing because that's not the way hinduism is designed it's really a kind of psychotherapy it's a kind of way of understanding your own issues your jealousy your anger your pride your frustration and all that emerges through these gods so the gods sort of public discourse at this point uh, is very different from the way you are communicating to us as to what you see hinduism to be and how it uh, functions isn't it yes see public discourse is controlled by the king the king doesn't care for your material or spiritual well being he cares for his power mm -hmm. and in a country like ours power is about mobilization of opinions so that's always been the case kings don't care for human beings mm -hmm. we care for ourselves i care for my life you care for your life and the scriptures are not written for kings they're written for the human being even a king is a human being going through all kinds of you know i work with some of these politicians and i work with rich people and i see they the also corporate leaders at one point or even now all of them and still do and privately i am in touch with them mm -hmm. and the story is the same whether you go to a slum whether you go to a refugee camp whether you go to a palace the insecurity doesn't go away we are all Bra brahma's children we are told that our natural instinct is to be avaricious greedy we seek things because we believe material things will solve our problems mm -hmm. more money i have the more power i have the more safe i will be the more valuable i will be and so people spend all their lives mm -hmm. accessing wealth accessing power in the process creating a violent ecosystem what is called ranabhumi a war zone we create a war zone what we call in capitalism competition yeah uh, uh conflict competition rivalry and you know this kind of a rat race doggy dog world and 
Hinduism says, you know what, that's the world of Brahma. Hmm. And you have to ask yourself that, that that's the that's the default programming. But we can step out of this. And Shiva comes into the picture saying that the point of life is to outgrow hunger, not the pursuit of food, but outgrowing hunger. And therefore, he's shown as a mendicant who sort of almost mocks this obsession with wealth and power and he rejects wealth and power. He's the yogi, he's the tapas who sits on top of the mountain and says, oh, this is all foolishness. So he's Mahadeva, he's not Deva. A Deva is an ordinary human being who, you know, that's why we do namaste to everyone because we're all Devas. We have power. Yeah. We seek. For, but Shiva is Mahadev. He doesn't care for anything. He's indifferent he is you know he's what is called in sanskrit udasin indifferent the sufi word for this is malang to be in a state of ecstasy because he doesn't care for the material things but now that's not the way you can live your life that's i mean come on that's great and wonderful you need to participate in the world and therefore the goddess goes to him and says that you know that's not that's you it's already this is not the way everybody can live you need to engage with lesser beings who live on earth and so she brings him down from kailas to kashi mm -hmm. And Kashi, if you have been to Banaras, you'll see it's a city of markets, of crematoriums, of mandis, of melas, and people living cycle their lives. Cycle of life. Like cycle of life. Yeah. And yeah. he's brought down here, he's brought down here and told, this is a, you have to engage with these people. Mm. And this descent of the god is called Avatarana, coming down, coming mm. down to the human level and dealing with humans. And this is the realm of Ram and Krishna. And Ram comes from a royal family. And Krishna comes from a cowherd family. So it's really a class divide. Yeah. You're showing a very different positioning. Very important because you should know what your position in society is. Now the question is, imagine if wisdom enters the world of ignorance. How will it engage with the ignorant? How will a wise man engage with stupid people? And that's what Ramayana and Mahabharata are telling us. Ram is the wise eldest man who comes to earth as an elder. He's told to be a king. He didn't choose to be king. He's not ambitious about it. He just happens to be the eldest son. So, so it's he the birth order that determines his It's destiny. deterministic. Like you chose, uh, one day you're told you're a king, then one day you're told you shall not be king, go mm -hmm. to the jungle. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't seem to be, he takes everything in a stride. He's not like, oh my God, I wanted to be king. And now, uh, you know, I was about to get promotion. I was about to be CEO of the company. And now I've been kicked out of the company. You know, I walked in one day and I was told, hey, this is your badge. Please leave the company, which happens, right? That's Ram. But Ram is like, yeah, it's okay. And he moves on, which is strange. Nobody finds it strange. This is not how humans react to tragedy and crisis. Mm. But that's what they're showing. A wise man will not attach himself. He doesn't get his value from the kingdom. Mm. And that's what they're trying to communicate through Ramayana. That's mm. what this Krishna, on the other hand, does not carry the burden of kingship. Mm. He's a cowherd. He's dancing and singing in the forest. Mm. And he's uh, dancing with the milkmaids. You'll never see Ram doing that. So they're showing you that, you know, please be aware of your privilege. Beware of the status and where you come from. That tells you a lot. You can't, we would like to be whatever we want to be, as we say, you know, I have the freedom. And the, the scriptures are saying, you know, you really don't have the freedom. If you're born in privilege, you are unfortunately forced to behave. You have to respect the fact that you come from privilege. If you come from a space where you don't have privilege, you have a very different approach to life. And that's how the Ramayana and Mahabharata are communicating with us. Mm. So that's Shiva who is withdrawn from the world and is being forced to participate. Mm. There is Ram who comes from a royal family. And there is Krishna who comes from a cowherd family. And so now you see how these design wow. is. Yeah. So Dev, that I remember you saying once, uh, you know, that to look at Ram and interpret him purely as the rule following dharma, um, you know, dharma obeying, uh, Maryada Purushottam as slightly simplistic. Okay. And there is so much more complexity. And in fact, you see in Ram, a person who has had to submit to what society expects of him and what he's what is right for him to do or expected of him to do. I want you to elaborate on that a little bit more because there is something there which I think people will you know understand why then Ram has sort of jumped out of that pantheon of different gods who have different roles, different privileges and stories uh, and different therefore yep. destinies. Why has he emerged in a way as the focal point of so much uh, uh, attention, uh, you know, public attention, political attention, all of it? The problem statement of Valmiki Ji when he's writing the Ramayana is, I have got someone who is supremely wise, hmm. supremely powerful, who is infinity, 
who is now being given a human form. He's an avatar. He is now bound by the rules of space and time. He's born of a mother's woman's body, which means he's he has to experience death. He has to experience all human experiences. But technically, he's all powerful. He can destroy and change anything, but he is not allowed to do that. He has to respect what is going on. Like magically, he can do so many things. He can have superpowers. But his he's being told. So it's not, you know, normally we talk about ordinary people becoming extraordinary. Here the story is opposite. How will extraordinary people behave in ordinary circumstances? Mm -hmm. And the grace that they have to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. So that's what it is. Now when it comes to Maryada Purushottam Ram, and I would ask Bollywood, how would you imagine it? And they would typically imagine him like, you know, the some of those films where Amita Bachchan acts like a head school teacher. Mm -hmm. Mar you know, what is that called? Mm -hmm. uh, Parampara mm -hmm. and Pratishtha, mm -hmm. this kind of a strict school teacher. Many people genuinely believe that mm -hmm. Maryada Purushottam is the strict school teacher. It's the great God who tells you, follow my rules. If you don't do, I'll bash you up. Mm. I'll throw you in hell. And that's the vision that people have of a rule follower. Mm. While they don't step back and ask the question, what is rule? What is the meaning of a rule? Why do rules exist? Mm -hmm. And the clue to this in the Ramayana is in the, right at the start of the Ramayana. When you start reading the Ramayana, it begins with the storyteller, Valmiki. It's outside the story, actually. And they tell you this little anecdote. They tell you of one day Valmiki is walking and he sees a um, two birds flying in the air, enjoying themselves. And there is an arrow which is shot by a hunter and he shoots one of the pair and the, the bird dies and the female starts to wail and scream and cry and he's very moved by this tragic sight. He gets very angry on the hunter and he curses the hunter. How dare you do this and all that kind of thing. And the curse comes in the form of a poetry. It, it takes the form of a melodious chant and he says, Shok says, Shlok Nikla. And that's how the um, story is told. But what is important in this story mm -hmm. is that he gets angry with this hunter and the hunter really is telling, you know, I'm doing my job. My family's hungry. My, you know, I have to feed them and I'm a, I know how to hunt and therefore I hunt a bird and that's all I'm doing. I'm just doing my job. Mm. You, by the job, unfortunately, has consequences mm. because when I kill a bird, somebody gets hurt. The, the, the pair, I have broken a pair of birds and I've hurt someone. And the, so am I a good person or a bad person? Am I a good person for feeding my family or a bad person for killing a bird? And Valmiki suddenly realized this is called Dharma Sankat, the ethical dilemma of life. So there is a moral responsibility he has to feed his family. But there is a moral dilemma that emerges because in feeding his family, he has hurt someone. Now, why do rules exist? Rules exist so that we know how to live our lives. What are we supposed to do? How are the rich supposed to behave? Pay your taxes on time. Do your, you know, respect the rules on the road. But every time we follow rules, something, our freedom is being curtailed. Yeah. Our freedom is being taken away from us. So following the rules is painful. We hate, we would like to lie in bed all day, but nine o'clock have to be in office to be on time. So the dharma of following the rules comes with the ethical dilemma of what you give up in order to follow the rules. But why do you give it up? Because if I don't do this, the larger ecosystem will not benefit. People with less power uh, will always be at the mercy of those with more mm -hmm. power. So rules have a purpose. They exist to uplift people. And so Ram is the person who ensures these rules are followed so that everybody is uplifted. But he's aware of the tragedy of rules, mm. the horror of rules, that a rule is taking away our freedom. It's not letting us do whatever we want to do the way Shiva wants to da sing and dance wherever he wants to do. Ram can't do that. So that's what Maryada Purusha, it's a tragic role of mm establishing order in society, fully aware that, you know, people really want to have a good time and they want to party. They want to be in Badu, Madhuban with Krishna and dance and sing. That's why Krishna's Madhuban yeah. and Ras Leela is so yeah. beautiful. It's the opposite of Ram's almost straight jacketed world. But that's the storyteller that telling you both these worlds and telling you, you know, both matter. Hmm. But a king cannot be in Madhuban. A king cannot be in this dancing ground because a king lives for other people. And Maryada Purushottam is someone who creates an ecosystem for the joy of others. In the process, he suffers a lot. So he goes to the prison, you know, he goes to the exile. Yeah, yeah. He is not allowed to keep his wife. People judge him for saying, how can you treat your wife that way? And he's not able to defend his stand because it's really indefensible at one level, but it is justified at another level. And that complexity, otherwise, why would a storyteller telling the story of God on earth create mm. such complicated things? Why mm. would you just say he killed the demon? 
and lived happily ever after. Wouldn't that be a great story? Yeah. But then yeah. that wouldn't be magic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, magic happens. In, and these, like, for, I'll give you a simple example in Ramayana about um, decision making. By law, the eldest child in the family has to be the king. That's the law. So, um, Dashrat's eldest wife, Kaushalya, has a eldest son, Ram. So, that's a no-brainer. It's an algorithm. However, for a long time, Dashrat doesn't have children. And therefore, he decides to marry a second time. And he marries Kaikai by giving the promise to her father that her son, which is, as per astrologer, she'll bear a great son, will be the king. So, he has given his word. Yeah. Second, he also gives a boon to Kaikai. Mm -hmm. uh, the point being, there is now a dilemma between the royal law and the king's integrity. Mm -hmm. And that's how the story begins that, okay, what am I supposed to do? Because by law, Ram has to be king. But if I have to keep my word, Bharat has to be king. Mm -hmm. So nobody is at fault here. Mm -hmm. Nobody is at fault here. And if Ram and Bharat were normal people, they would fight it out. Mm -hmm. There would be war. We are seeing what's happening right now in the world, right? There are international courts are talking something. People yeah. are fighting over land. Intelligent people are arguing about genocide. It's it's a point of debate. And we're all witness. We're all witness to it. The people dying, children dying, homes being ravaged, and we are just witness to this. And we're and like you, said, you have friends on either side, and you're like are discussing it. Yeah, discuss and you're like you know both sound. Fair. Each one is just, each one has these beautiful arguments and, and the lawyers on either side are brilliant. And you're like, uh, it's not easy. But you see, laws only work when there is compassion, empathy and a sense of generosity. Mm -hmm. Laws don't work without that emotional base. Ram has that emotional base. Bharat has that emotional base. And therefore, Ram says, I will not fight my brother. Give the kingdom to him. And Bharat comes back I saying, I will not take, yeah, I won't take, I won't become, I won't take king. this. What is this guard, nonsense? Guard it for you in trusteeship, in a sense. So, this trusteeship, it's not like he's obeying and he's, yeah. everybody says, Kitna achha bhai hai. I said, Do you realize the kind of complex idea they are presenting? Yeah. It's so difficult for this is extremely difficult emotionally for anyone to do. You know, we fight over small 10% or 12% uh, property disputes. I mean, if you have, I'm sure, covered property disputes across India. We know right now on papers, you open the papers, you see uh, how politicians behave, how uh, people behave over land and money. And it's vulgar and vile. And Ramayan is telling, here is a character who is walking away from it all. Mm -hmm. And here is his brother who refuses to accept this, you know, manipulative, clever game. Watch them. Observe them. This is how Atma would behave mm -hmm. when it lived amongst mediocre, ordinary people. Mm -hmm. This is what is divinity. Mm -hmm. Divinity is not a god out there who does magical things. Divinity is the ability to walk away from it all. And so this is Mahadeva, this is Mahavira, this is the great idea mm -hmm. in the material world. So you don't have to leave the world. While Buddhism and Jainism always spoke about give, giving up everything and going to the forest, Tapasvi Raja mm -hmm. is in society and he's the hermit. He's mm -hmm. like, you know what? I don't want a kingdom. And his brother says, you know what? That's not the point. The point of kingship is to be a take care of people, govern people. It's not about do ego. You, do you think that people in general, uh, you know, people who worship Ram, people who are devotees, who are at Ram Mandirs doing artis. Do you see the complexity of the idea of Ram uh, being understood or, you know, or is this uh, something that is too much to ask for in the context of um, ritualized religion? I mean, how do you see this? So I'll tell you something which is a personal experience. Many, yeah. many years ago, I was invited by a Jain Muni a young Jain Muni, um, I suddenly got this invitation saying that, sir, my Guruji wants to meet you. We read your article and we want mm -hmm. to talk to you. So I was quite intrigued that, you know, Jain Munis and you're not, never engaged with them. So I said, I'll, okay, I'll come. It was nearby. So I went across and I saw this very young man and I spoke mm -hmm. perfect English and very well educated, obviously. And then you realize that maybe one of the Jain Munis from those affluent families who gives up everything, yeah. and, you know. So um, it was a very awkward moment. I didn't know how to deal with him and all that. So he told his uh, people that Ekant. So Ekant is solitude. So they closed the door and he started talking. And he said, I really like the way you are writing the Jain mythologies. That really, you you have captured nuances. And he said, I love the way you're uh, writing about it and all that. And then, um, you know, I said, I'm sure you're... It came out of my mouth. I said, you know, people are listening to you. And they looked at me and said, they don't listen to me at all. Hmm. 
you know, here was this man, sir. There were about a hundred people outside. Mm. And he said, they don't listen to me at all. They just bow to me. They feed me. They take care of me. For them, religion is uh, saluting me. When they don't realize it's not about me at all. I am just the medium of Jindavani, which is the J Jain way of saying. I am telling them, but I don't think I'm being heard. I'm fully aware of it because that's the human condition. So I saw a great deep compassion in this young Muni and he was very young and he was so compassionate. He's like, this is the way it is. They don't, but you, this is, uh, my thing is to do this until a point will come and I'll take the vow of silence, but I'll keep doing this. But I, I do not give knowledge with the assumption it will be received. And he says that requires a lot of tap. Requires a lot of tap, you know. So he said it, and I had like literally goosebumps. And you know, here you're seeing this practicing young monk talking to you, appreciating your work. So you're in this ego trip, feeling very nice about it. But he's also telling you something which is valuable to you. Yeah. That don't assume that you will be heard. Why do you want to assume? Khana parosa jata hai, hajam karne ki shakti unki hai. They will digest it. Now you can't digest it for them, even if they eat it. Mm. Even if they listen, buy your books. And I think that has a, been a very powerful encounter for me because this is how Indian wisdom transmits itself, right? He's also coming from the same traditions, from his gurujis, he's reading, thinking. This is a conversation you really don't get in other parts of the world. It's a very Indian conversation. Let's talk about the women in Ramayan because uh, uh, Sita, uh, you know, Kaika, you mentioned Sita, of course. Uh, I remember Manthara, Supernakha. There are so many female characters in the Ramayan. Um, do you think that they're interesting because there is certain amount of agency you interpret certain amount of agency that they have I remember again you telling me that Sita actually has exercised choice her choice at very critical points as the epic unfolds so you want to talk a little bit about these female characters because uh, again uh, while they have an important role in the epic uh, they are not part uh, of the conversation today I don't think that uh, uh, Ramayana is part of the conversation today because even when you see uh, Ramayana, it's always presented as a, st a new story of a king who, of a king who is very powerful, which is not the Ramayana at all. Ramayana is not about power at all. It's about wisdom. So it's become a power narrative from a wisdom narrative. So leave, leave it at that. That's what happens, um, you know, um, with storytellers and storytellers sort of whatever the king wants to hear will be happen. Ramayana is a peculiar epic with a lot of female characters. Mm -hmm. When you read the Mahabharat, the characters lose their agency with each generation. I mean, that's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. But Mahabharat is a story where you can actually plot and graph the decline of status of women. Mm -hmm. While in the Ramayana, you don't really see that. It's almost as if a the age just before this happens, an age where women still have some kind of agency and they seem to be semi-free. They're not completely, uh, they're not agents entirely, but they seem to be agents. So whether it's a mantra, whether it's a kai kai, whether it's a surpanakha, whether it is Sita, whether it is Mandodari, they all seem to have some form of agency and they express it in different, different ways. Maybe not the way we imagine it today, but they're uh, spectacular in the power, the way they present it. So Kaikai -kai demanding and saying that, you know what, you give me what I deserve. This is the boon you have given me. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm just asking my boon. Mantra reminding her that, you know, do you want to be the second in, come, you know, second in the line? Don't you want to be the CEO? Do you want to be a vice president or a president? You know, that kind of conversations, which are very real. Surpanaka, who desires these handsome men and uh, is surprised when they reject her because she's so used to getting what she wants. She's mm -hmm. a princess. She's from privilege. She is Ravan's sister. She just goes to a man and says, I want you. And the man is supposed to Hmm. So you see this passion emerging. When you go to Lanka, when Hanuman is going to Lanka, he encounters women warriors. He encounters a, 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 you know, Simhika and Surasa who are these fierce creatures, but female, not male, which is very unusual. And Lanka is de defended by Lankini, a goddess. Hmm. So you have this fast, it's not there in any other story of India at that time. The mm. only stories we had at that time were the Buddhist narratives. In the Buddhist narratives, women are a background role. They don't have a foreground. They're not foregrounded. Yeah. So in a strange way, Ramayana is a story which sort of presents women as key characters. You cannot have Ramayana without these women. Mm. 
Hmm. They're all there out there. There's good women, bad women, proud women, jealous women, mean, petty, spiteful. But they're there. They're human. They're there out there. And I think that's fascinating about the Ramayana because the women have desire. Surpanaka has a desire. Um, uh, you know, uh, Sita has consent. She's, uh, she chooses. Uh, she refuses. She says no. She When she's told you shall not cross the line, she crosses the line. When she's told stay in the palace, she says, no, I will come with you to the jungle. So she seems to have a voice. Mandodari, um, you know, when Ravan dies, she, re she marries Vibhishan and he becomes the king of Lanka only because he marries her. So the remarriage is talked about. Um, Tara is an intelligent diplomat in the uh, Vanar kingdom and um, who negotiates peace between Ram and Sugriva. These are minor episodes but she is a participant in the diplomatic uh, you know, tensions are being sort of uh, mm. sorted when Lakshman gets angry that Sugriva is not keeping end of his bargain. Who is participating? Not a man but a woman. Tara. Mm. So Valmiki didn't have to create these female characters. These roles could have very well been given to men and nothing would have happened other than maybe Surpanakha. Hmm. Other than Surpanakha, where a, the, her female sexuality plays a key role, every other character could have been male and it, uh, nothing would have happened to the story, hmm. we assume. But by making the women present, he is drawing attention to the world of women. And I think that's quite remarkable. For its time. I must, I'll make it a little personal for me at this point of time. Uh, born into a Hindu household, but agnostic uh, and sort of stayed away from uh, ritualized religion. Um, not sure about God. Um, how do, how do I engage, um, you know, we, like, Pran Pratishta of a temple. I couldn't understand Pran Pratishta. And thanks to you, I saw your little uh, video explaining what it means, you know. So there is so much that, uh, you know, and a lot of people uh, say that um, people of my generation, urban Indians with an English language education have been deracinated. The point I'm trying to make to you is how does one engage when at at my core, I genuinely believe that religion should not be in the public space and that it's a private quest, you know, for something much larger and beyond everyday life. How does one engage? So, uh, you know, we have to go a little bit of history on this. So when people talk about, you know, religion should be private and not public, they're really referring to Christian and Islamic worlds. Remember how I described Christianity and Islam. There's a God out there who makes yeah. the rules yeah. how humans should live. Now, imagine a society where you've been told God will tell you how to live and these are the rules of living. Hmm. Right? So you have document A. And then humans say, you know, we don't believe in this God. So how do we live our lives? Let's create document B. Now, which is more important, document A, that God has given you and you believe that God has given that to you? Or the non-believers who say, no, 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 we have created our own little constitution and we want to follow this. And now there's going to be a conflict. And then they'll say, you know, separate the, this is personal, this is private. This is a conversation which happened in worlds where the church was very powerful, where the Sharia was very powerful. Mm -hmm. India never had that. Mm -hmm. No God gives you a set of laws to live. You know, Manu Smriti is reflections of Manu, who is a man who is reflecting on society. He's not God. Mm -hmm. Although in his book, he very cleverly says the God told me to write this book and all that kind of things, because that's a marketing thing which is there. But traditionally, India doesn't have this idea of God telling you how to live your life. You are really uh, engaging with society, this kind of divine idea. All the people have tried to force fit and make Manu Smritis. And you, when you repeat it a thousand times, which is what academicians did, they tried to equate Manu Smriti with a Sharia. Mm -hmm. um, people started believing it. They said, oh, even Hinduism is a religion. There's a God who makes rules. These rules are the Dharma Shastras, which is really a Brahmin document and nothing, nothing else. Used by kings because you need laws to govern a land. Um, you know, And it was very popular between the 3rd century and the 13th century century, even outside India, it was a very popular document because, it was, you know, you need a you need something to work to control a kingdom or to manage a kingdom. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. That's one point. The second point to remember is the 19th century when the British ruled India, mm -hmm. they demanded an explanation from Indians. Tell us what this Hinduism is. And nobody knew because you just lived it, right? You just did your pujas and every, you know, Rajasthan had its own gods and Gujarat had its own gods and Odisha had its own gods and Bengal had its own gods. Nobody had this idea that suddenly the British sort of literally put a gun on your head and said, okay, Hinduism seems to be there. Please explain. The word Hinduism emerged in the 19th century. The word Hindutva emerged in the 19th century. It didn't exist before that. It was a kind of a vague collection of cult. We knew we were not, we were not. We were not Muslims. We were not Christians. We were something, but not that. 
That's the only thing we knew. But now you're asked to articulate it. Put it in a document. Make a PowerPoint presentation. Tell the rulers of the land who you are. And this sort of put us, everybody, on the defensive. And the benchmarks were Christianity and Islam. And that is when Raja Ram Mohan Roy and Madhusudan Dutta and all these people, the intellectuals of this time, tried to hmm. articulate Hinduism. And they, you know, they were embarrassed by the rituals. They were embarrassed by the temples. They were embarrassed by the cows and the the. They, they were just embarrassed by the common folk because they were the elite. They were the intellectuals. And so they rejected it. They rejected it in their writings and they intellectualized it. So when you read Raja Ram Mohan Roy, when you read uh, uh, even Sabarkar, all of them, they were all intellectuals. They were educated people. They were, they didn't know how to deal with the mass hmm. worship. And they said, oh, that's inferior. There's a superior religion, which is Upanishads. Mm -hmm. And they came up with these very lofty philosophical ideas, which doesn't deal with day-to-day -day life. It deals with all these. Even now, the Gurujis talk about these Vedanta. And they sound almost like these strange things. They're talking about your soul, cosmic soul dimensions and all these kind of things, which makes you feel good, but doesn't explain and resolve issues. Doesn't make you a nice person. Doesn't make you a good person at all. It just makes you feel, oh, now I'm in touch with the divine. because The divine is walking around me. And all these kind of gobbledygook. What I have done is I've looked at the stories. I've looked at the rituals and said, what is going on over here? Why did these stories emerge? And when you study mythology, you have to study rituals across the world. Mm -hmm. And one thing which emerges from rituals is that religion doesn't come from an intellectual space. It comes from an emotional space. Yeah. It comes from insecurities of human beings. Yeah. And so if you understand... Perhaps, human to, perhaps to try and answer questions for which there aren't any... There aren't any answers because death, nobody has this... Death. You know, you know, it's existential angst. Nobody will ever know the answer. So I give you some answer to calm you down. But honestly, that's not a complete answer, right? When I tell you, moksha hone wala hai, after death, this is going to happen. Nobody knows. We, nobody has, there is no evidence. We just believe it. We just follow it and believe karma hai. Why was I born in this family? Why was I given this body? Why, why am I facing tragedy? Why do I live in these times? There's no answer. So Hindus came up with the idea of karma. We came up with this idea, tumhara bhagya hai. But these are all, explanations. These are not, are they truth? We really don't know. It's not a scientific, I can't prove it. There's no falsifiability. There's no re replication. There is no way I can prove it. And I think this is what we miss when people say that, you know, I don't connect. I said, are you an insecure person? And if, if anybody's saying that I'm not, they're lying. Everybody's insecure. And we, religion comes from that space. When people go to temples, when on a, I remember my friend coming from England saying that, you know, he just came and he's lived all his life as in England. He said that when I came in India, I see people stopping in front of these temples and doing uh, rituals. Do they believe that there is a God sitting inside that room? I said, please think of yourself as an insecure person wondering who has no control over half the things in his life, going to work and hoping that something, if I do, life will become better. And these are his coping mechanisms. He goes to the temple, he prays, he he's doing what his parents did or what he was taught by his friends. And he just does it because it makes him go through life better. He's less insecure. He has some hope. So do you have a problem with that? And he said, no. I said, is he hurting you? No. I said, if he wants to wear ash on his head, if he wants to put flowers and he wants to feed a cow or he wants to go every Saturday to a temple and ring the bell or chant a mantra, if that calms him down and enables him to be a good husband, good father, if it enables a woman, you know, in, in old days when, you know, when the, it's called when the uh, merchants would travel across the seas, women back had no, they could do nothing about it. They didn't know whether their husbands would live or die. Will they come back the next year? It was a year's journey to go to Southeast Asia and come back. What do you do? So the Guru said, oh, tum ye vrat karo. So in Odisha, there was this Sudhusa Brata. So in this month, before the ships arrive, you do these rituals, you fast, you eat this, you go to this temple. You, he gave them a set of things to do. And really, it's therapy. It keeps you busy because you wake up in the morning, you're told wake up in the morning, take a cold bath and do this. And it's giving her hope. It's helping her that her husband will be safe. He'll come back and life will be normal again. That's what religions do. They they help you go through the day. Hopefully make you a better person. Take away the cruelty in your heart. That's all religions do. People try to intellectualize it too much. And I'm like, it's just this much. Why are you making it so complicated? Yeah, I, I find it very interesting that you keep coming back to one underlining thought. And that is empathy, kindness, gentleness, isn't it? 
Yeah. You see, it's this is what has happened. Religion, when I hear a Richard Dawkins talk mm. or one of these Christopher Hitchens, all these rationalists, atheists, charvakas talking, they really, these are men without empathy. These are men who don't understand feelings. They just don't deal with underprivileged people. They don't know what it means to be poor. They don't know what it means to be broken, to be abused, to be shattered, to have nothing in your life. How do you uplift these people? You can't give them rational thought and say Newtonian physics will solve your problems and some app built by Elon Musk is going to solve your problems. If you start believing that the, today there are young men who believe that if I have an iPhone, I will live a better life. And that's a tragedy. That's horrifying. That's what capitalism has done. We have told people oh, that... While, while, while you make this point very lucidly about what religion offers people, what what I want you to answer now is what happens when these coping mechanisms, when things that give people comfort uh, are, um, you know, then used, uh, grouped together and pushed in other directions outside the space of the individual and what he or yeah. she needs from religion how do i as an individual guard myself against that see uh politics is about mobilization of power so yeah. that's politics. so if i want to get power i have to mobilize power where is power power with people how do i mobilize people i mobilize people using various technologies mm -hmm. um and uh, sometimes rational, sometimes not very rational. Storytelling yeah. is very powerful. That's why speeches are so powerful. Yeah. You know, Hitler could give a speech and mobilize people to wipe out another group of people. Media, therefore, is always controlled by politicians because they want to control the discourse and shape the way you think. And what they do is they feed on your insecurities. When you talk about the deracinated Indian, remember this scientific Indian, which we were told that we are all going to be scientific and mathematical, in a way mocked religious traditions mm -hmm. and made fun of people who went to temples and did their whatever religious thing they would do. You know, I've seen people wed attending weddings and making fun of wedding ceremonies and saying, oh, what is this foolish? What is happening today around the world is this rational mind, which was contemptuous of religion, is facing a backlash. Mm -hmm. across the world. Mm -hmm. Science said we'll solve all the problems of the world. They created antibiotics, they created steam engines, they created computers, they created electricity. But that doesn't take away human insecurity or inequality. You know, Germany is one of the most rational countries in the world. It has super inequality, as much inequality as India does. So just being rational and scientific doesn't make you a good person. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make you generous and kind and compassionate. Science cannot make you generous, kind and compassionate. Uh, and that is something that people forget. And what is happening around the world is what is called the left movement, which claimed to be rational, is being pushed back, saying that we don't want you. So you have Islamic uh, resurgence, Christian resurgence, and it's vilest form, unfortunately, not even in the 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 the, the enlightened forms of these religions. It's and really Hindu the resurgence and Hindu, and Hindu resurgence is happening, and Buddhist resurgence is happening. Yeah. I mean, everybody thought of Buddhism as this yeah. very uh, non-violent religion and until Shilanka. suddenly they saw Burma yeah. and they saw Burma. Sri Lanka. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, suddenly the West was like, oh, Buddha, my, it's so nice. And they realized they were people, they're ordinary people fighting. You know, Buddhist monks on the streets revolting with guns. And they were like, oh my God, this is not the way Aung Sai Suu Kyi has to behave. Because, you know, we have decided how Buddhists are supposed to behave. And I remember the anger with her when she was ne negotiating with the Janta. Because she was dealing with the real problems of political problems. And um, uh, the outrage of the morally upright West, which is now, of course, supporting genocide. So, <laughs> you see, this is what happened. When you start making fun of traditional beliefs which have been around for thousands of years, for a reason, because you've never understood them. Rather than understanding them, you mocked them. Mm. Now they're back. Mm. Because what you promised did not deliver. Mm. You did not deliver the promise. In fact, you made things worse. You know, I, I, I see the technocrats around the world trying to save the world using big data and artificial intelligence. And I'm like, oh my God, these boys with toys really are so dumb. Because, you know, I engage with some of them and you just are shocked at how stupid they are. Because, and, But politicians seem to understand human condition. Unfortunately, they manipulate it. They see it as uh, power which I can use. So, so how does a religious person who understands what religion is offering him or her, 
guard against being manipulated is there any thought you have yeah that? that's a very difficult you see that is ravan right ravan <laughs> understands people but the seduction of power is very strong so you'll see many gurujis begin by saying wonderful things once you become popular hmm. like you you know one day you are doing um, tweets and you're doing these facebook updates and you start getting likes and suddenly you have a million followers hmm. after some time now the you want to keep the million followers with you yeah and you start doing pandering to the gallery and mm. you forget what your job is mm. and you start saying it's like ram saying that i must do things to make people happy and the price is paid because he the people say we don't think your wife should be the queen of ayodhya yeah and he's like um okay mm. Mm. when you listen to people mm. rather than sort of maybe step in you have to pay a price your children will go you uh, an innocent woman is sent to the forest her children are sitting in the forest and you are sitting in the palace alone and this is what you are saying be careful of i have to take care of people so now they will decide how i should live my life and that's what happens to most gurujis they can't be honest after some time they will start saying things that will make the audience happy Mm. and you are not allowed to give them the bitter pill you are not allowed them to shake them up you are not allowed to challenge them you sort of get you get seduced by your own fame your glory and you get you know the private jet and all the guruji 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 namaste and it's a very seductive thing i have been there i see it it's so easy to fall prey to it but then you have to decide what you want in life you want to live your life for yourself or do you want to sort of fall prey to this and i think that's the challenge that's the apsara dancing around you saying that you know come my way i'll give you happiness and we all know the tapasvi has to struggle so the tapasvi raja has to deal with the tapasvi raja has to deal with ram rajya and that's the story tapasvi raja on one side but ram rajya mein tap hota hai ki nahi do the people get and this is what valmiki in a way very beautifully through stories is making us think about he doesn't give you a prescription he yeah. gives you a description yeah. Yeah. i think that's the power of ramayana and mahabharat because none of them in the hinduism is not prescriptive by any sense of the word only gurujis give prescriptions scriptures don't the vedas don't give you prescriptions while while i totally understand the point you make about not offering prescriptions uh is there <laughs> is there anything that people should um expect from ram rajya what is if if i were to say that ram rajya is an ideal society what is it what is the bare minimum i should expect it should transform you into tapasvi raja because it's not about always being fed it is about you feeding Mm-hmm. i think people are too hungry all the time and we become like the monster which is asking yeah. for more 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 mm-hmm. so it's not like ask what the country will give you ask what you will give the country no ask how will you outgrow your hunger and i think that's more important i think if we discover the tapasvi raja within us um the struggle of the tapasvi raja mm-hmm. how do you experience wisdom mm-hmm. in an ocean of ignorance and stupidity how do you maintain compassion and kindness when you're surrounded by cruel mean petty spiteful people that's the great struggle and i think that's tapasvi raja that's the forest we live in we must not let a surpanakha overtake us we must not let a ravan enchant us with his golden city sita sits there and says i will not be enchanted by your golden city i will not be enchanted by your magic i won't be in- i won't be intimidated by your violence i will sit and wait wait for ram to come and i know he will come and even when he comes he will it doesn't mean i'll have a happy life with him but yeah. you shall not take advantage of me mm-hmm. so i think that is a very powerful thing where sita is very clear that i don't you shall not take benefit just be, ram may turn out to be inadequate mm. but you shall never replace him is a very powerful line which is being told where it's very clear that ram may not be perfection but that's my choice that's my choice you know you can't yeah. tell me what i am supposed to choose and like and i think that's a very powerful statement for human beings dev that i'm going to ask you one last question you just wrote this piece called title there's a ram for everyone i really really enjoyed reading it because you know this we've gone through so much in this conversation and uh, at the end of the day religion mythology history uh 
you explain very lucidly you understand where where something seeps into something else but there seems to be a, a tendency to want to see everything as history yes uh, which which is material facts right yes. uh and mythology and religion which is which is not material which are not material facts and i know you you explained yeah. this to me in the past and th you talk about it again and there's a ram for everyone i think you need to close on this is is ram who we now talk about so much and hear about so much and uh, you know uh, want to look up to or most people look up to uh, or are expected to look up to uh, how do you see this person ram as a historical figure a religious figure a mythological figure um so again let me allow you to explain some theory uh, you see we are burdened by a world where christianity islam and judaism dominate they are the major religions of the world they tell you what is the benchmark of religion they are telling you and these mythologies and they are mythologies whether it's islam whether it's christianity or judaism the colonial powers refused to call them mythology saying that they are history and because in their mythology the god participates in human history and shapes human history and there is what is called teleology there is a place where we are going to go one day uh, Je jesus christ will come back hmm. one day there'll be judgment day judgment day is part of history creation is part of history so it's a very material way of thinking very uh, historical way of thinking and indians have felt this burden to make their religion historical when it was actually about psychology hinduism has always been about psychology buddhism is about psychology when you read islam when you read uh, christianity when you read judaism there is no room for psychology it is all legal it is you are supposed to do this you are supposed to do that you are supposed to do wear this you are supposed to eat this you are supposed to sleep it's all very material social practical there is no room for psychology so rather than us influencing them they have colonized our minds yeah. and this colonization means that i want to see oh my gods as historical figures and people get fed you know they get really really agitated and triggered when you say that history is not so important indians have never paid it we have never valued history saying jo piche see when you do uh, rituals in hinduism i don't know if you have ever seen but when you do funeral rituals you feed the ancestors by putting the thumb outside your body saying it's gone you are not allowed to even refer to the dead body of your own parents by their name mm -hmm. you know when you perform rituals in hinduism when the dead body is in front of you i remember the brahmin would never refer to the corpse with name saying that your father is gone your mother is gone that's just a body we have always rejected the past we have said the present matters this matters this moment matters this future doesn't matter so hinduism is about this moment now ram is now krishna is now shiva is now politicians love history because history and unfortunately historians have used history to establish social injustice and used politics for social justice and this is unfortunately the left wing thinking history even today you the woke movement is about looking at history and saying oh these are the things that human beings have done wrong 100 years ago 500 years ago 1000 years ago slavery was there racism was there so now we have to correct it so you see history feeding into politics and this is a very western model and i will not indulge the indian politician who wants to mimic the west we have been colonized far too long and i will not be colonized i will refuse to participate in a colonial discussion i am not answerable to the white man the politicians may be i am not for me the ramayana and mahabharat enables me to live the current moment in a fulfilled and happy way it helps me appreciate wealth prosperity affluence abundance uh, deals with the moral and ethical dilemmas of existence and i am happy with that i don't need whether he was born in 5000 bce or 20000 bce or whether the pharaoh ramesses was named after ram if that gives your ego a kick how pathetic and sad that is but good for you maybe in the next life you'll realize the joy i am experiencing now
Devdutt, what can I say? As usual, uh, you know, such complexity. And uh, what I find so interesting is how easy it would be for you to become simplistic, to simplify, to dumb down. Whereas, uh, you know, and sort of come to the level of people who are looking for easy fixes, um, you know, and become a guru in the process. <laughs> and, you know, you are clearly saying no to that upset I'm wondering around you. And taking the hard path, which is staying with the complexity, going with the nuance and making compelling people who engage with you and your thoughts to um, to man up, to woman up, <laughs> to grow up. <laughs> To grow up, I think. Yeah, so, uh, uh, I, think... I, I really appreciate, um, I really appreciate the fact that you're not giving in to what is so tempting to be so, you know, to simplify, to offer guidance, to offer prescription uh, and to stay with the complex and the nuance. And that's the hard path you've chosen to tread. And uh, I really want to express great respect for that. Thank, Thank you, Dev, that very Thank much you. for this conversation. And um, keep talking. Uh, we're going to keep listening. It's going to be good going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you so good much. luck. Bye. Thank you, Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you.